All right. Can everyone see? Yes. Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, okay. So we are here from MTSU today as part of our team, um, and we're going to share a little bit about exploring the ways we are integra integrating open educational resources and practices and an introduction to education course. So go ahead. Um, so here with us today is myself. I'm Dr. Angela Husser. Uh, Dr. Karen Reed, who is our librarian and research specialist on staff. And Dr. Kim Godwin, who is our instructional designer and um, all things online and um, all the fun OER stuff. And then Dr. Deanna Brown and Danielle Moore, um, who are not able to be with us today, but they are absolutely a part of this work. So today we're going to talk a little bit about um, assumptions that ourselves and maybe you have about OER. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the learning and research that's happening um, at MTSU around OER. And then we're going to share our press book and the H5P resources that are a part of this book so that you'll get a chance to do it. Okay. Hey, I think everybody that's here knows, but just in case, uh, a quick review of just what is OER. Um, OER is really, it stands for Open Educational Resources. It's any type of educational materials that are in the public domain. Um, it's materials that anyone can legally and freely copy, use, adapt, reshare, uh, make it our own. Uh, so the idea behind it are the um, five R's. You can reuse them. Uh, so you can use the content in the same form that it was in. You can revise it. You can adapt it, adjust it, modify it, improve it, alter the content so that it's fitting the needs of your context and your students. Uh, you can remix it. You can combine the original content with other OER uh, sources uh, to create something new. You can redistribute it by sharing copies of the original content, the revisions you've made, um, or the ways that you've remixed it with other things. And you can retain um, everything that's with it. So you can keep access to the materials even after the course. So you'll have it and the students will have it. All right, so we're gonna start out by thinking about some of the assumptions that we in the room have about OER. And we're gonna do that. Um, if you wanna go ahead to the next slide. We're gonna do that. Uh, if you click that uh, QR code, there is, uh, there is a um, word cloud, which is through H5P, which is an open access source that we used as part of our press book. So if you wanna click the QR code, your screen should look something like that. Let's see. Hey, Karen, you'll want to type in at least one response. Um, I also put the direct link if the QR code isn't looking in the chat. Oh. If y'all have never used the word cloud before, you type one in, then you hit OK, and you can do that up to three times and then hit submit. 
you might have to roll down on the screen. So I'm seeing a lot of things here that uh, we thought at our own institutions. We're going to give you about 30 more seconds, although I still see it moving. Uh, this is something that if you use asynchronously with your students, um, like as an assignment before class begins or in an online class, that they'll see this in the same way, like as students complete it, um, like think their responses will pop up. All right. Um, so any questions or any problems that we had with the OER in general or doing the word cloud in general? Are we good so far? Good so far? All right. So I'm seeing a lot of interesting things here, like compliance issues, um, the fact that it's free, one of the great big words there. Um, I see the word level playing field um, together. I think that was brilliant that you didn't put any spaces because then it leaves your words together. Um, somebody's got some experience here. Um, that it can be time consuming, um, that it's perpetual, that it's helpful. So some words that are uh, actually kind of going in opposition of each other, um, but also some things that we also thought uh, when we began this journey at MTSU. So if you want to go ahead back to the PowerPoint slide. So I'm going to share a little bit about some of our assumptions and the ways that we're learning with this at MTSU. So um, in the fall of 2022, so this past semester, we did a pilot of this press book in, um, this is an introduction to education course. So the students in this course are, are um, I guess I didn't tell you about the class. The students in this class are anywhere from freshmen to transfer students. Um, so they're generally freshmen, sophomore or transfer students. Um, they can be, they are not yet admitted to their teacher education programs, but we've got uh, early childhood, elementary, middle level, um, and special education in this class. We also often have um, people that are headed to be counselors or family and con consumer science, or family and consumer science, social workers, those sorts of people that are in this class. Um, so one of the things that we felt really passionate about is that on, one, on the one hand, this course is sort of a gateway class, like you have to pass this class in order to get into your teacher preparation program, but we also wanted it to be um, maybe inviting people in, um, and some of the traditional resources we were using were expensive, um, and that, that wasn't happening. So some of the things that we really wanted to make sure of with this book was that we were checking the resources in the press book itself so that we had a diversity of perspectives. Um, we also were concerned about accessibility, uh, both in terms of cost and um, in terms of having them able to have the book the first day ready to go. 
Uh, we wanted to, there's three modules in this course and then a closing module. And we really wanted to adapt the formative and summative assessments in each of those modules um, to align more closely with the textbook. Uh, we also created an instructor guide or cre that included a summary of key points, uh, the activities, uh, including the H5P activities like the one you just tried and videos for each module. And then as instructors, we met at the end of each after module to reflect on how things were going. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the fall. So we used this rubric, uh, which looked at the dimensions of open educational and culture responsive features, um, kind of put those two things together. And when we began this work in the fall, we focused on inclusive content and on critical consciousness. In particular, we were looking at the two uh, indicators that are circled in red so that the course contains inclusive content, uh, brings in diverse perspective, it's tailored to student backgrounds and needs and interest. Um, for us, it was really important that our students were not only seeing themselves in the text as a form of engagement, but being able to see themselves in the profession of teaching. Um, we also looked at critical content consciousness and instructional materials and having um, a diversity of authors that that brought in multiple perspectives. So we added, um, these are five of the pieces that we added in addition to um, a podcast that was focused around two of the schools in Nashville, which is about uh, 40 minutes from where we sit in Middle Tennessee. Uh, so we added, uh, you can see here, um, a, a specific video that was around boarding schools, um, a video by Kevin uh, Kamashiro about teachers making a difference, uh, the perspectives of gay teachers, uh, the perspectives of native language learners, and then um, we have a video about AD, ADHD and how that's that's awful, but not really, uh, is this person's perspective. So we were trying to make sure that everything that they were reading and seeing wasn't simply, um, you know, uh, white female teachers, which is what generally what the profession is. So also in the fall and within our press book draft, like we were paying attention to uh, our, the assumptions we had that this would increase student engagement. So we did see in the fall some improved attendance. Um, in the class as a whole, 78% of our classes had 100% attendance. 94% uh, of the absences were, were reported prior to class. Um, and this is in the content class. And this class also has a one credit practicum where they're out in the field assigned with it. Um, and all the students attended all the hours. There was one late arrival and there were no absences, which with a uh, you know 2000 level course is, is pretty much unheard of. Uh, we also had um, an email from a teacher where most of the schools, uh, most of the students were placed that shared how much the school as a whole um, enjoyed having the students and that all the teachers had positive things to say. And in fact, we're using them again this semester. Uh, we had some assumptions that um, hopefully if they were more engaged with the text and with the resources we were using, that there would be some improved work completion. This again is from last semester. Um, so we had 100% on-time submission of their midterm self-assessment and their first module reflection. They also, they, they are in two practicum sites. So in the visual, you can see that uh, they submitted, all of them submitted all their work on all their reflections without us having to go and um, poke at them and bother them to get their work in. So, so far, so good. Another thing that we had assumptions about was around their learning with the content. Uh, we do have quizzes, uh, three quizzes throughout uh, the time on this course. They are low stakes quizzes just to practice a lot of the terminology that's in education. Uh, however, as you can see here on the first um, module quiz, and this continued throughout them, um, we had actually 110% uh, class average um, for their score. 
uh, they have they have a study guide, which if they complete, they get an extra 10%. And there was also um, a two credit bonus question. And so the students, most of the students got uh, more than 100% correct. And then finally, um, we came in with some assumptions about how students would see themselves in the text. So this is from uh, our first module is about like history, govern, governing structures um, in schools. And this is one of the, the midterm assignment and the final reflection is um, drawn from ungrading. And so it's really asking them like what's connecting with them with the course, how can we make it better and what grade they would give themselves. So one of the questions they were asked at the end of this first module is, what have you learned that you're most excited about and why? And I'll read this to you just because it's particularly powerful, I think. But she said the most exciting thing that she've lear learned in the course would be about the civil rights era within education. All of the acts and history throughout the civil rights era have been a topic of discussion my entire life. After studying the different acts and actions that were meant to help the Black population in regards to education, the legislator brought during this era helped, but it left room for those that resisted the, this new age in America. Unfortunately, this room that was made provided so much hate and protest that was allowed. Although it is not depicted in the same way as before, the racism and hate is still an issue in 2022. Being able to see it directly correlate with my future career has been devastating and enlightening. Racism has been a key component within our country since its foundation. And it is the same for the foundation of our education system. Where I grew up, my school zone was primarily white, albeit it was a rural area that did not have many people in general, but that is still no excuse. I did not realize this issue was still prevalent today to the extent that it is. I had always known it was a problem, but not to this degree. The podcast we listened to for class was eye-opening. To see such blatant and open segregation is heartbreaking. Moving into this field of work, being aware and educated will help me be a better teacher. I think this has been the most exciting topic for me because it allows me the opportunity to make a difference in the future. So, yeah. So Dr. Karen Reed, do you wanna take it over? Sure, I'll just talk really briefly before, um, honestly, we get to the really, fun stuff with Kim and see how all of this actually implemented out like our actual OER. But um, I, I came to this, um, I've worked with Angie for years as the education librarian here at MTSU. And so I've had the pleasure of seeing her in the classroom, working with the students, knowing students in our education program. But um, I changed uh, positions um, last October. So now I'm the research and data librarian. So coming into this and kind of seeing both sides and knowing like, ooh, this would be a really good research project. <laughs> and um, so we started talking about it <clears throat> along those terms. So we're looking at doing um, two streams of research actually with this. So we're looking at the development of our students into future teachers. And then we're also looking at student engagement with the OER materials. So our first two research questions address this student engagement with the OER materials piece. So um, they are, uh, number one, what are students' perceptions of the quality, utility, and format of open educational resources, including OER textbook, um, the embedded materials such as the video and the podcast, and also the H5P activities. And then number two, how do students experience OER, including OER textbook, embedded materials, again, such as the video and podcast and H5P. Um, how do they experience this OER in an introduction to education course? Um, specifically. So yeah, with and then um, with the OER materials themselves, we want to approach this, you know, from the technical and the user centered side, um, you know, how easy it is to navigate the materials and work with them. But we also want to approach this from the structure and the content of these materials. So incorporating the diverse perspectives, even diversity in the videos and the images um, that we use, um, as Angie talked about. And then for our third question, um, which is how do students collective and individual sense making of historical, philosophical and ethical factors 
introduced with open educational resources shape their identity as future teachers. And so our concern is that this class is the entry point class to an undergraduate teaching degree at this institution. And so we're very focused on developing not only their pedagogical skills of becoming classroom teachers, but also developing their hearts for teaching. And so this naturally entails a huge shift in their mindset because they've always been students and now they will have to be the ones in charge of leading a classroom. And so what does that look like? Oops. There we go. Um, we will have an abundance of data sources for this research. So um, first off, you know, just the, the attendance data and the completion of the class activities. Um, there are substantial student reflection writings taken at the midterm and final. We are conducting focus groups throughout the semester after they complete each of the three modules. And then we will survey the students at the end of the semester through Qualtrics. So our timeline for this data collection is that we are currently collecting data during this uh, spring 2023 semester. And we're gonna repeat this process for four more semesters going through spring of 2025. The bulk of our data will be from qualitative sources. So we're going to use a process of open coding of the student reflection writings and the focus group transcripts. And then um, we will be performing descriptive statistics on the survey data sources. So this is just an example. We just did this data collection um, recently for the module one. We did focus group um, research with our students. And these were some of the types of uh, prompts that we had um, to get them talking. Fortunately, Angie, Angie and Jana have like really good engaged um, students. It did not take them much um, <laughs> to get them talking. I loved it. Um, we just uh, kind of set up digital recorders on the table and just let it go. And they just, um, I think they just, they kind of forgot about that, you know, that, you know, they, they weren't so self-conscious and, and all of, you know, a recorder. They just got talking because they really care about these issues. Um, they had a lot of good things to say. So again, looking at it from how is this course shaping them um, and becoming teachers and having heart for this work? And then also, how did the OER textbook um, help with this? Is, is this um, you know, conveying the information that we would like it to? OK, so now the fun stuff. I'm turning this over to Kim. Um, this is her area of expertise. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Angie. Uh, so as I mentioned, I am an instructional designer with MTSU Online. So uh, some of my areas of expertise um, outside of instructional design are OER and then also the integration of engaging activities like H5P, the work cloud that we did at the beginning, and then we'll actually show you some additional ones. So we'd like to give you a chance to actually look a little bit at our press book. Down there in the bottom corner is the QR code. If you want to scan that, uh, you can go take a look at our book. I've also put the website into our chat if you would like to kind of go look around a little bit and see uh, what's in there and and how we were able to use it um, a couple of things to note about it is that it is broken down into um, five main categories um, and then after that are some extra back matter things that's what press books calls all the stuff at the back is the back matter um, where there's a glossary and some references because you know we got to make sure we're citing and then we intentionally put our h5p activities in there um, in completely shareable ways uh, because we are actually tying them into d2l so that it counts for students participation uh, and we can't share those directly in the press book and then link to d2l so we have added them publicly to the back i tell you that because that means that when you go there, those are all there and they're free for you and you are welcome to take them with you. Um, all that we ask is that when you use them, that you please clone them again to not disrupt the formal one that is listed. Um, most of them are available through the free H5P account if you do not 
have um, an institutional level account, you can get them through there. And if you choose to copy over and utilize this book for your own uses at your own institution, you can also um, download the information and upload it directly into the Pressbook if you choose to not have it communicate with D2L for participation purposes. Uh, and I know that was just a lot, but that was the background of why it looks like it looks. Um, so um, Karen, can you go to the next page so we can actually kind of play around a little bit with some? Uh, we wanted to show you a few of the different H5Ps that we put in there and some of the information that we are getting from students about these different activities. Um, we used a, a big variety of them within the book. Um, so if you if you go to that back matter page, you'll see a really long list and we will we will talk about that some more here in a little bit, but we wanted to give you a couple of examples. So feel free to zap that QR code, uh, or I will also put the link in the chat if you are having some QR code unhappiness today and you wanna take a look at that flashcard. Flashcards are really awesome. Um, we've all done them our whole lives, but these, because they are digital, the students can use them over and over again. You can um, update them in real time if you want to change your pictures or you want to change some of the information. But students are kind of drawn to them because they're a little bit more fun than just reading a definition because uh, there are images that they can look at. And the way that this one works is that there's the image and then um, there's the definition of what type of um, schooling it is, and then the student will simply just type their answer in the bottom. They can check it and see if they got it right. Um, there's only three options. There's three cards, and the three things that can be typed in are at the top. So we'll just go ahead and share. There was a couple of times people got two right and the third wrong, so I still kind of don't understand that. But hey, whatever. Whatever makes it work for you. Um, so that's just one of the opportunities of something to look at for the students and how it kind of enhances that engagement and, and keeps them going with the material. If they haven't read the book uh, or if they haven't reviewed the resource that is linked within the press book, they're going to have a hard time answering these. But because they're um, low stakes, no stakes participation activities, they can do them multiple times over and over until it makes sense to them. Um, there's no penalty for doing it more than once. The idea is that we want you to recognize the information. Karen, can you go ahead and go to the next one? Okay, this next one is a timeline. So the activity that we used for this one is actually sort the paragraph, which might seem sort of strange at first, but we wanted the students to be able to move around the information um, so that they could begin to really process what it what it was for the, the different entities and, and who impacted what and how and the order that they went. And I have added the link for that too, in case the QR code is not working for you. Um, and you're welcome to go in and you can play with all of these while I'm talking. I'm, I won't be offended. I can't see you not looking at me anyway because your cameras are off. So I won't be offended at all if you get in there and play with them. And uh, the great thing about this one is that you really can just um, drag those paragraphs around uh, in whatever order you want. And you can change it over and over and over again. And you can continue to check and see where your accuracy is. And part of the reason that we talked about doing it this way is it's not necessarily the date, like the exact date that something happened, as much as it is the order in which things occurred, the impact that one decision had on the next decision, on the next event, on the next thing that happened uh, within this timeline of activities that we're wanting them to know. We want them to know about these things. Um, and and know how they impacted uh, students and segregation and integration and civil rights in general uh, and how that is making a difference with the with education as we move forward. Uh, it does give the students a different way to process their learning in a very active way uh, without that anxiety of getting something wrong. And that's um, pretty important, especially with key components like this. I think. Oh, the one thing I wanted to add as an instructor of the course and that uh, Kim taught me to do on the back end with the H5Ps is you can actually set it up. So like if they get, 
I think it's set up to like less than 70%. Um, it actually sends them a note that says, um, try again, make sure to open up the textbook. That's not cheating. You're not meant to memorize, use it as a resource. You know, so it actually kind of cues them to like, hey, it's okay to do it again. Thanks, Angie. Uh, and that is one of the behavioral settings in H5P that if y'all have some questions about that, we're going to make sure that you have some time here at the end to ask questions. So if you have questions about some of those things, we're happy to talk about those. And things can be set at, at many different levels. So if you got 40%, it tells you to go do one thing. If you got 70%, it tells you to do something else. If you got 100%, it congratulates you and tells you you got a gold star or whatever it is that you want it to say so that it has automated feedback. And some of that is is really helpful, too, so that faculty members are not having to really go in and focus and grade on every little thing it is doing some of that stuff for you so it's providing some of that feedback to your students in real time as they are doing these authentic activities okay karen if you want to go to the next one okay so this is the this is the big one um this is the one where all of them are listed so um, you can do that QR code or, you know, I'm going to put that link in the chat because y'all found that out about me by now. So, Karen, if you want to click on that H5P activities for uh, non-users. So this is that back matter that I mentioned in the uh, in the beginning when we were talking about the press book and the link to it is actually in uh, the chat. If y'all want to go and look around. Uh, we are happy to show you some, um, but as y'all are clicking around, if there's any that you want to take a look at, feel free to unmute and tell us which ones you want to see or give us a little message in the chat, but we will show you a couple of them in real time if you would like. Um, Karen, if you can click on the one that's chapter three timeline, that is actually the one that we were just talking about. If you can kind of move some of those paragraphs around uh, simply by clicking on them and dragging them. And it will just move them to different locations. Uh, you can use the up or down arrows, uh, or you can click and drag, whichever way is easiest for you. One of the things about H5P, too, that I think is important to add, these will adapt to your device. Um, so if you are doing it on a phone, or you are doing it on a laptop, or you are doing it on a I have a 34 inch curved monitor. Um, so depending on the size of your screen, it will actually adapt because they're smart technology. Um, the one thing to remember is that frequently you have to scroll down, however, to get to the submit or check option so that it can submit the information um, within H5P or within uh, to communicate with your D2L if you have it linked. Um, so that is one of those. Karen, if you want to hit that check down at the bottom and it can show you um, how we're doing. Uh, so we're doing OK, right? We got a couple. Uh, she wasn't really trying, so it's OK. You got two, though. That's awesome. Um, it will show you the solution or you can opt to retry um, and then you can do it all over again. Um, so it can show you that information and a lot of those settings can be changed and updated based on the needs of what you would like for your students to be showing you in the in the class uh, or in the activity. Um, so you can do that as many times as you want. Um, Karen, can you go um, back. Uh, and click on oh, one more. click on that link again. Let's see. Um, Let's maybe look at one that's a little bit different uh, that we didn't add. Um, if you want to scroll down, I think it is, let's go with chapter 13. I think it's where it is. Let's click on the one that says memory game. Okay, have at it. <laughs> this one is about um, different, you got that right the first try. That is amazing. Um, good job. So this is like that old memory game that you probably played earlier in life, but it is um, because this chapter talks about uh, different professional associations and organizations within um, teaching and learning. This one gives them an opportunity to start associating the name of the organization with the core purpose of the organization. So we took the the logo of the, the different agency and 
aligned it with what that purpose was. So one is the picture and one is the words. So you can flip them around until you find the the ones that match. Like Karen got the first one right. Um, and then you just go through until you find the ones that that actually match. So it's about processing that information and remembering what some of those different ones stand for. And I just wanted to show you all the memory game because I think it's fun. Um, and it may take students a little while to do it, but they can, um, it will go until they get them correct. Um, so, um, so that's another one. Were there any that you all saw that you wanted to take a look at before we head on into some, a question time? Because I would suspect at this point we have some questions. <laughs> Actually, do you want to show them the um, one of the open ended ones? We forgot to do that. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, Ken, if you want so, to click on any of the ones that say open ended, um, there's one in every chapter. There's one in every chapter. Um, so in these, these are an opportunity for them to uh, typically they're affiliated with a specific resource or a certain topic and the students kind of go in and they they type in what would be an essay. This is the H5P essay option and you can go in and you can type in as much or as little as needed. Uh, but what you do in the back end is that you actually set some specific keywords that you're looking for uh, within the the content of what was reviewed within that chapter in the press book uh, and then it will actually tell them um, how many of those they found so you would go in and say um, for this one you might have um, Lachlan you might have Warner you um, might have choice you might have um, uh, there's a ton, but there's a lot of options of different things that you can put in there and and then you can put some alternates as well. So like if they don't capitalize or they do capitalize to really kind of address some of those things. Um, and as you can see, Karen did great. She put enough words to get the one star to to get the credit for it. But the prompt that it tells uh, with you when it actually does this um, like this one says awesome but if it tells you that you didn't quite get enough um, so if you, you know, got a 70 percent or you got a 40 percent if you got like a 30 or 40 percent it'll tell you to go back and review the resource again whether that be to go rewatch the the video or listen to the podcast or reread the chapter uh, it will tell you to go do that again and then try again um, at the 70%, it tells you that you did a great job, but that we're looking forward to talking uh, with you about it because they, this is what you're actually going to talk about when you come to class. Um, so when you come to the classroom environment, these are one of the topics that's going to get covered. So you've taken that opportunity to ensure that your students have looked at the resources before they come to class. So that when you're sitting there in your class and you ask a question, you're not just staring at blank faces and hearing crickets, you are actually able to start having that engaging conversation. Yep. And I think one of the other things that's important for this semester in particular, because the H5Ps are all new, um, is the students know that they are all new. And if they feel like they did a great job, like they did it right and they get it wrong, they don't get upset, they don't freak out, they just they email me and they say, hey, I think XYZ isn't working right because, and they'll send me a screenshot. And Kim has taught me enough that I can go in the back end and say, oh, they're right. Like I can check out the reports and I can override their score. Um, we've also, with the open ended responses, because at this point we're kind of guess like, here's what I'm looking for with keywords, but some of them are a little less specific. And so if the students have done a really good job, and they're not getting their points, then I'm gonna look at what they discussed and then I can add that as a variation to the keyword so that in the future, like if somebody takes that perspective on it, they don't get it wrong, so. And that's one of the key things I think about H5Ps is because it is um, a, a live HTML5 programming, that's what H5P stands for, because it is a, live HTML activity, when you update it, it actually updates it across the 
the spectrum um, so that is continually growing and learning and you are continually growing and learning with the feedback from your students and the experiences that you're having. And, and students are good to tell you when something didn't go quite right. They're happy to point out that it didn't work. And so it's a great learning experience for us as well as we're practicing these things and trying these things that the students are having uh, that level of feedback about their experience. So that's just a, a great additional uh, component to this. Were there any others that y'all wanted to take a look at? Um, or at this point, are there any questions that anyone has about press books in general, about H5P, about our processes, uh, or anything about that? I'm happy to, to do my best. Yes, Anna. Though I think you said that you went by a different name and I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, we, I, I'm with the Tennessee Board of Regents System Office and we do statewide dual credit and we actually use the Foundations of American Education at Critical Lens as our OER for our, our intro to education. How far have you, has your press books strayed or how, how much have you adapted that book? I'm just wondering if these interactive, the H5P activities would be something that we should add to our version or provide for our teach, our high school teachers, or if it's pretty much, you know, it, it's not really from that textbook, so it may be confusing for students. Uh, great question. I think that's probably a me question. <laughs> I um, we started with that book. Absolutely, yes. Um, there were a, basically in the fall when we did it, we kind of went through and um, took some things out because it was too much. You know, like for some for what we were doing, we reordered it um, so that it went in the order that we wanted, and then we added a lot of the videos and stuff. So the Promise podcast, which takes place in Nashville and is about um, two schools that are in Metro Nashville, um, is embedded throughout the textbook. And then there's videos, particularly bringing in um, perspectives that are other than um, African American or Caucasian, um, because those were missing in that original text. But otherwise, yeah, I would say unless it refers to a specific like the Promise podcast or a specific video, you could probably use it. Thank you. Yep. And I am dying to know more about the dual enrollment thing. So, yeah, because we got some of that going on too. The dual enrollment and the dual credit and the dual all the things. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's also um, a great point about the H5Ps because they are, are live and because you will clone them before you use them. Everyone nods with me so they don't mess it up. Yes. <laughs> um, um, because you can do that, uh, many of them you can edit uh, in the instructions and in the question what it is that you're asking. So if it is specific to a podcast or um, a video that was specific to the book, you can always change that to something else. Um, but many of them had to do with the information that's in the press book itself. So you'll just kind of want to go through and see which ones best match um, the activities and see what order that they're in. Um, and I uh, see that someone has asked about the ADA compliance, and I was hoping somebody would ask about that. So H5P has a lot of built-in ADA compliance. There's a lot of things that you cannot do without um, adding the alt text. There's things that um, that specifically are embedded in that HTML backend code to make it so a screen reader will work. There are some that it um, are not accessible. It tells you that in the in H5P, which ones are not yet accessible. Um, and so just it, ones that we cannot make accessible, you'll want to avoid using those, but specifically ones like that memory game that you were just looking at, the images in there require the alt text for each of those cards. So a screen reader would actually, as you are 
clicking over those cards, it would see the cards. And then when you click on the card, it would actually read to you what is on that card. And it would actually tell you, uh, this is the logo for this agency. Uh, or if it's one of the ones that has the purpose, it will actually read to you what that purpose is. Um, so many of them are ADA compliant and that you can use. And we tried, I tried really hard to make sure I was only using ones in um, in this press books that were already there, um, I intentionally avoided many of the ones that that weren't um, available for that. The biggest one is Image Hotspot that has a really hard time um, being compliant because of the way it's set up. So you may want to avoid that one um, unless you know for sure that somebody's um, not going to need a screen reader. Um, but uh, yes, they are. As long as you don't go in and intentionally start changing the text behaviors or the behavioral settings in the back end, um, most of them are instinctually um, listed as ADA compliant. Yes, Rachel. Uh, so I was really uh, interested in the, the free response from the student because, um, you know, when we survey students about their, uh, their um, feelings about having uh, diverse authors or having their identities represented in the text, they don't necessarily uh, put that up at the top of the list. They, you know, they put price at the top of the list. But um, once you've got uh, the experience of having those diverse authors uh, and the uh, materials uh, the students are seeing um, and recognizing that they're getting value from that, is that something that you're specifically going to explore and report on? Yeah, and I think exactly what you're saying around this idea of that's not something we can necessarily ask them directly. <laughs> so trying to figure out um, ways that that'll come up authentically is something we have our eye on. Uh, what I have noticed, um, and I've kind of started just as an instructor teaching the course, just sort of paying attention, like when certain videos will hit, like the one that talks about um, where it's a teacher that is gay and talks about how they come out because they can't and that video or they can't not come out that video um they're talking about how how they felt like they were doing like initially they didn't come out because they felt felt like that was going to be harmful for to, to their students but then they felt like they had to because they had students that were struggling and they wanted to be seen as a role model in a safe space and so one of the things that I found was like after after the opportunity they have to do that video, like those conversations just sort of naturally arose in class where people would um, share, like some of the students would share, um, you know, if they were struggling with similar things. So I think that, yeah, I think that because of the intention that we've put in the resources that are in there and the fact that we're very open with our students about what we're doing, I, I, my, I suspect that those conversations are going to come up naturally, but yeah, we're going to poke and, and ask them as well. I don't know if that answers your question. Yep. Okay. Giselle, <laughs> Janelle, I'm sorry. Hi, Janelle. Hey, yeah, I've got two questions. Uh, so the first one is, I was curious how many sections you used this book in. Did you use it in all of, all the four sections or just a trial in like one or two? And then also, like, what was your timeline as far as how long it took you from like start to finish when you started thinking about? Uh, yeah, just your project timeline. Um, so MTSU uh, got a grant to support instructors in starting to explore this Um I, was that maybe a year and a half ago, Kim? Is that right? Uh, we got the initial grant the first year of COVID. Okay, the uh, first year but, of COVID. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> was like the the spring of 2022. Um, I applied for a small grant and we started, because at that point I was playing around with OER resources, but I really didn't know what it was or all the things it could do, honestly. And so I kind of... Um, I put in for the grant. We got it. I'm the course lead on this course. And Danielle Moore teaches that course all the time. She's one of the ones that couldn't make it today. Um, usually in the fall, we have five to six sections, uh, depending on how many we have out in the high schools that are dual credit. This fall, we're going to have eight. Um, and so right now we are using it across all courses. Um, 
So yes, we're attempting it in the fall of 2022. The first time we did it, it looked very different. Uh, there was no H5P. It was not embedded in D2L. Um, this this semester, uh, there's only three sections this semester, and we've got all faculty teaching it. And so as we're trying this out, um, we've got people that were on the grant. Uh, right now, we're on a grant from TBR. And so we've been able to pay us to do a lot of this work. Um, but uh, yeah, it's we've been working on this for a while and I could name you all the next steps that we want to do next. Like we're not done. Um, in particular, like the feedback, I think that we could do a really good, a better job on the feedback as far as instead of just good job, you got it, but making a comment on exactly what the question is and how it connects to what we're talking about in class and how it, but I've given myself permission to say that's next semester. Um, <laughs> like we have a resource for teachers, you know, just like if you got a Pearson textbook that you would get like a resource. So that has got multiple activities, the links to the H5P, like all kinds of things. So um, yeah, it's an ongoing work for all of us. And I'm probably driving Kim crazy because I'm like, I know, look at her, she smiles. She's like, yeah, you are. Um, Cause we, when we attempted to do the H5P sort of like the drag and drop one, that actually is a timeline, like what they're called isn't necessarily how they work. And so I, so finally it was like, no, this is the question that we want them to engage with. You figure out which H5P matches because that was hard for us to figure out. Um, the one thing I struggle with with H5P is there has to be an answer. So there's some things that I want the students to do that are like, you know, look through the code of ethics and highlight the keywords and phrases that are important to you. And I, I can't do that in H5P because it wants me to say something is right or it's wrong. And to me, there's nothing that's right or, you know, that's, it's not right or it's wrong. It's what's important to you. So definitely been some struggles and ongoing work. And if you'd like to help, come on down, Janelle. <laughs> I just want to say, I think this is very impressive. It looks really great. And I love all the interaction, all the activities that are put in there. I think that's why the students love it so much. So good job. Thank you. Yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> uh, we've got just a few minutes left. So um, how about we go back to the um, screen and go to the next slide? And if y'all want to go ahead and zap that QR code and I will of course put the link in. If y'all want to take just a second and then pick an emoji. Pick an emoji. Right, it's a little bit fun. Um, and the really cool thing about the emoji is that you can select from a huge variety of emojis or they can uh, pick their own. Uh, I recommend condensing it to five and picking and that they have to pick from those five, uh, but there are ways that you can expand it. And we just think this one's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I did this one after the very first week, and then I have it in the very at the very last week of class. Like, how are you feeling? But... And we can let that keep going. Um, if y'all still have any questions, we do have a couple minutes left, so we're happy to answer any of those as y'all are playing with your emoji cloud. Karen, I think we can go ahead and go to the 
the end. We wanted to thank y'all so much for being here today. Um, and if you have any questions or you uh, need any information, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we are happy to uh, ad answer additional questions, especially if you have H5P questions or Pressbooks questions. Um, we have several users in our group uh, that are happy to help as best as we can. Um, and it appears that Angie just put my email in the chat. So yes, it's kim.godwin at mtsu.edu. So please feel free to reach out if y'all have questions um, or if you need anything. Uh, and I this has been recorded, so I'm pretty sure the video will be available through the open ed resources. Um, but if you need anything else, please let us know. Everybody have a great day. Thank y'all for being here.